every so often a book catches my eye that I don't really have to think about buying. I already know that I'm going to love it before I've even purchased it. And this is one such book. It's called Abandoned London. And it's politely termed a coffee book, though I think that what that actually means is an adult picture book. Because as with all coffee books, it's absolutely bursting with images. I think it's over 200, in fact, um, which are a collection of abandoned sites in one of the best known cities of the world, London, and each has its own stories and secrets to tell. So I am delighted to be talking to the author of this book today, Katie Wignall. And Katie is a multi award winning London history blogger, um, Blue Badge uh, tour guide. And, uh, and if you don't know, follow her already on Instagram, please do, because it's a brilliant you're, you're brilliant on Instagram Katie it's at look up London so I would thoroughly recommend you do that so hi Katie thank you for joining me today thank you so much for having me yeah so before we get going on some of the sites because there's there's a few that I want to sort of delve I'd lo- I would love to talk to you about all of them but like <laughs> there's quite a few so I've chosen a few to uh, to delve into with you but before I do that I wanted to ask you first what made you want to create this book? So I'll be completely honest that I was actually just approached by the by the publishers. So it's part of actually a big series of abandoned places worldwide, abandoned war sites and things like that. So it is, is part of a kind of franchise, I suppose. And the publishers, Amber, asked me to um, help with the London version basically and so they presented me with all of these photos of 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 London and it it was then up to me to kind of add tidbits and information historical background and then also context in the chapters as you make your way through the book as well and they very kindly let let the uh, let me include some of my images shoehorned in there as well (laughs) Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So, so you got to choose most of the sites or? uh, Actually, a lot of the sites were already chosen. Some of them I'd never even heard of before. The magic of of London is this massive city where there's always something to learn. Oh, wow. So, so it was a, a bit of an exploration for you as well. That's great. Totally. And it was interesting, actually, because the period of writing um, and researching the the text for the book was actually during the first lockdown. And so I wasn't able to go, to travel to these places or, you know, um, going out and about was, was limited. So sometimes it was actually a bit of detective work to find out where these images were taken, you know, where these vantage points was and then deciding what to write about for them. Oh, wow. Well, that's really fascinating. So, I mean, there's so many sites in this book. And like I say, I would love to dig into the stories of many of them. Um, Because as with all good coffee books, the writing, I know you you were quite limited, weren't you, in space as to what you could put? Um, Yeah, I think um, it's any sort of about 50 words, you know, because the the highlights are really these, the images. And so sort of like guiding really you're always choosing you're always curating you're choosing what do I need to say and what can I possibly leave out and sometimes it's quite painful yeah I bet I bet it's almost like just having a tweet per per site almost it's really not much longer is it? (laughs) so um so what I've done is I've chosen the ones that I found myself uh drawn to the most and I found that they were the ones that were once a hub of human activity, you know, so perhaps they were essential to people's work life or social life. And now, I mean, they could have been their homes. One of them's a home we're going to look at. In fact, I think two are homes. Um, and 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 now, obviously, they're just lying empty. And I find I don't know. I don't know if you found that, but that's they're the ones that really draw me. The ones that were so essential to people's lives, and now they're just gone. They're just empty. Yeah, I, th- I think I totally agree with you on that. That is the draw of these abandoned places because abandoned suggests that they were once occupied. Mm. And so 
by going to them and seeing them as these kind of empty shells, you get this ghost-like feeling of all of the people that have passed through them through history. And so I totally agree, the ones that really stayed with me um, and I had to, you know, curate down what I was going to say the most were these places that were once full of activity, um, either as homes or as businesses. And now, you know, are these like quite eerie places if you ever do get a chance to, to go inside them. That's a really good point, actually. Yeah, it's that eeriness, that that feel that there was once people there that, well, ghosts, like you say, it's sort of a not 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 technically a ghost but that that energy that was once there so let's get on to the first place then I've uh, I'd like to ask you about and that that's Haggerston um public baths now this caught my eye because I used to be a lifeguard at my university pool and the building and the pool were in this Victorian public baths so when I saw this I was immediately drawn to it and I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about you know what public baths uh were used for you know were there a lot of them in London um and if you know what the particular fate of of Haggerston uh, was yeah so um it's hard really to overstate how important these public baths were um they really proliferated over London especially in the more overcrowded impoverished areas including um, Haggerston and the East End and in South London as well so these were public buildings um, which gave people that typically didn't have any running water or bathrooms as we'd know them today gave them a place where they could could wash themselves um, but like all public buildings you know they they're far more than that they're somewhere to socialize and to and to have this kind of shared community space as well so we tend to see this at the end of the 1800s early 1900s London expands hugely in the 19th century going from I mean about 1 million population to almost 6 million so it's a huge boom and this was one of the ways that um, the kind of welfare state was trying to look after the population. So let me just uh, I'm going to open up the the book and show people who um, just a, a, am I allowed to do this by the way? I better check I with you. So. I think so. I'll do it really quickly. Is in the uh, in the context of the book. I mean, there's well, one thing I noticed as well is there's always graffiti, isn't there? The graffiti artists have always managed to get inside whatever closed buildings there was. Yeah, and you know the the irony is these a lot of these places are closed to the public, but of course we have these photos. So <laughs> some people have been able to, to get in. I'm hugely in admiration of the urban explorers that are far more brave than me who have actually gone inside these places when they're closed to the public. And of course, although that technically is, you know, obviously not allowed, I don't even know, it might be on the illegal scale, but without that, we wouldn't have this record. No, and, and also it sort of forms another function in that when people realise how beautiful they are inside and those images are shared widely, it really galvanises people to then save them as heritage sites as well. So it kind of, by tweaking the, the laws, not that I'm condoning it, you know, <laughs> you sometimes help help preserve these, these spaces. And this is what's interesting, you know, with Haggerston because the story like so many of the places featured in the book is ongoing um there are plans to to renovate um and to 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 restore the baths not sadly as baths themselves oh that would be a shame i'd love to have seen that i'm i'm yeah. i'm, I'm I've, it's made me wonder whether my the place i used to work still exists i i need to i need to find out why don't we move on then because you've there said about um you know it, it it then makes people wish or uh, aware of these places and then that the impetus to uh, to try and preserve them but one of the places I wanted to ask you about people have been aware of it and have tried to save it 
and I believe it hasn't been successful. And that's a place called uh, Dollis Hill House. Um, it looks like it was really grand. And again, I will just flash at the photos in case I'm not allowed. Um, <laughs> But the, scar, the scars of staircases always get me um, in the wall where you can see where the staircases once were. And it really looks like it was um, it was a grand building. But what so what's the story here? Yeah, so this was a um, it was a Victorian building or just slightly uh, early 1800s. And it was a grand kind of country estate house surrounded by uh, Dollis Hill Park um, and yeah, I believe it was 2012 that it, it finally sort of lost the battle of saving it and has been completely demolished. So actually, again, one of the ironies that you see in the book is that these photos are actually the only testaments of some of these buildings that survive in London today. You can't actually physically see them. Um, again, this is one of the places, unfortunately, I wasn't able to visit because of, because of lockdown. And so you can imagine my shock and horror you know finding it and then actually to to go through and google street view and find that it no longer exists um they've done sort of something relatively nice in the park in which they've outlined the kind of ground plan of the house um and there are some bits of walls um but really yeah nothing substantial that you could actually stand inside yeah <sighs> And, and, and this was once a place where prime ministers were entertained, wasn't it? There's yeah, exactly. Gladstone. Um, yes. So, I mean, like these fabulous sort of country estates across across London in, in the areas that used to be traditionally more kind of rural and outside of, of the city. Um, yeah, this was a, a private kind of mansion, mansion house and it's it's kind of devastating to see it having been demolished. So let's go from Manor House to the other end of the housing spectrum. Um, it's a place called uh, Haygate Estate in Woolworth. And anyone who's a fan of Call the Midwife will probably be familiar uh, of the story about the, the attempts, I think it was in the 1960s, basically to get people into modern accommodation, but in you know a lot of people in a small area, and we get these high-rise um, blocks. Um, we call them flats. Other countries, I think, people call other cultures call them apartments, but we we call them flats. Um, and these are these multi-residential buildings, low cost, and and. and and they're obviously modern in their day, but over time, these have become much less desirable places to be, badly maintained, attracted crime. Um, and let me see if I can find the, the, the there was a, it, I mean, the picture in the book, um, again, the graffiti artists, of course, if, when I say artists, there wasn't, there's not a fat lot of art in this graffiti in this one. Um, but then you've got just an abandoned push chair at the bottom of a, of a staircase, which once led to people's homes. Um, and it just really struck me again, this was a place where people lived, this was their home. Um, but instead of improving these areas, the councils looked to have just basically tried to get rid of them. Um, and, um, you say here, you know, only one in, I think, five of the residents that lived here now, uh, well, sorry, so what, only one in five have managed to stay in the area. Um, can you tell me more about this estate and 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 what was hap what's happened since these photographs were taken? Yeah, so the Haygate estate opened in the 1970s, and just like you say, it was uh, really meant to be the new standard of living it was fitted with all uh, modern any all the modern accessible things that you would need in this new flat and I have to believe that people were well-intentioned and really thought that they were creating these neighborhoods you know in high-rise buildings um, but unfortunately as with a lot of high-rise uh, buildings across across the country and across London as well um, they they didn't quite live up to their promise um, and it did suffer with some crime although you know that's debated by 
local residents who also say it was a great place to live so it's always hard to be really nuanced in these in these conversations as well um unfortunately it's a kind of victim of its location it's an elephant and castle which is historically been an area that not much attention has been given to but then lo and behold when people realize how close it is to central london it becomes very desirable um, especially for for developers and so all this area of Woolworth and, and Elephant and Castle is being transformed and unfortunately those plans don't leave much space for existing existing residents um, there's actually a um, the research in the in the book came from a series of, of blogs from Haygate residents who were leading this campaign, you know, to try and save the estate. Um, but unfortunately, what once was modern and attractive in the 1970s is not going to be so for for new Londoners, um, middle class residents who are looking to to buy homes now mm -hmm. and so I think it was only about well as you say you know one in five who have managed to live in the same area that they've grown up in and that they've known all their lives um some affordable housing was meant to be given but as ever affordable can be anything up to 80 percent market rate so London is an expensive city it's I think you've actually put affordable in a price here so anything between 350,000 being the minimum price of uh, of a home now here up to 1.1 million I mean that's <laughs> it's not on the affordable scale for most people I'd have thought it's, you know out of reach for the people that were living there mm. at, at the time and yeah I mean it, it was um a lot a lot of these places you know they're not unfortunately they weren't all uplifting you know to write about London has its fair share of problems and it's hard in the book with limited space to address these and I hope that really it just gives people food for thought as they're flicking through the book and seeing some places that were designed uh, to really inspire people and then somewhere it just hasn't worked out and and question you know how can how can we do things better um, in the future yeah absolutely i mean it's uh it's not somewhere as well that if you didn't live on haygate you would have heard about so i thought i found that a really interesting story in the book finally though i want to move to a uh, a place of work and the reason one of the reasons is the photo is really striking uh, again i'm just going to flash it up but it basically looks like a concrete floor with a uh, four I think there's four visible but let's say three uh, really easily visible corkscrews coming up through the <laughs> through the through the floor it's quite a striking um uh picture and this is Millennium Mills in is this pronounced Silvertown or Silverton or something oh, else I call it I say Silvertown okay. um but um, I might I might be incorrect. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's a fascinating area of London. Actually, I recently did a virtual tour uh, for the East End Women's Museum as part of Newham Heritage Month. That's actually available free online if people want to know more about Silvertown. Um, and yeah, it's it, I mean it's an industrial hub of London, but it only really got going in the nineteenth century, and. It, it did that because it basically fell outside um, of the building regulations. So within the metropolitan area in the 1840s, these building regulations came in to try and stop, you know, smelly, polluting businesses within central London. But this area today, Canningtown, Silvertown, was outside it. And so factories just proliferated. Um, in the area, Millennium Mills being being one of them, basically. And so, what was this place? What what did they use? The, what was it says a mill, but what what did they do here? Yeah, so it was a flour flour mill. Um, Millennium Flour was their was their best selling best selling product, um, and it it was absolutely huge. I mean, it was providing um, flour for for across across the UK and employed you know thousands of workers. A lot of them women as well, actually, because um, the men might have been working on the docks. 
books and so women were involved in packing and the less kind of um, heavy labour tasks inside it. So are these, are these cork yeah, screws? sorry, there's cork screws. <laughs> are, these, are, these, are these slides for bags or something? Are they, is that what yeah, so as I understand it, the bags would have come down the chutes there to, to minimise some of the heavy lifting <laughs> going down between them. Seems very sensible. I do wonder if anyone ever had a had a go themselves. <laughs> it looks <laughs> yeah, you do. Oh gosh! Apparently, the um, the lifts actually were quite scary because this was one of the places that I have actually been lucky enough to do a tour of um, on another at another time. And the lifts were kind of continuous lifts, so you sort of walked into them, and it just you know doesn't bear thinking about that there were sadly some accidents of people getting trapped in all Ooh. sorts of. I've been in a lift like that. Um, Birmingham University used to have a lift like that. The, but the food, yeah, I don't know if those, if that still works though. Maybe maybe someone's lost their nerve. But it it, it was quite. It seemed okay when I was there, but maybe, maybe they need to be maintained very well. I also noticed on these corkscrews, there's like it looks like almost like tally marks on the on the side. Do you know what they they were there for? So let me have a look at the, the picture as well. Um, I don't know what the tally marks uh, were for on the side there. As I say, I haven't seen these. Um, this room itself, it's not open to the public just because of how unstable um, it is. So I don't know what about them, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. But it, so is this building, this building is still here then, but obviously then you, you've only got certain access to, play, uh, access to certain places. Yeah, so it was actually on it. I can show you what it looks like today, actually. There's another image of it. Oh, yes, yes. So it's really striking. I mean, it's a it's a kind of beautiful building and, and similar to um, uh, similar to a lot of the buildings in the book, it, they it's constantly under redevelopment, just like Haggerston Baths that we talked about earlier. Um, they've been saying it's going to be redeveloped for about 10 years, but I think they're finally getting around to it now. Um, and of course it's going to be public realm space, some office space and then flat, basically. Mm. Um, it's, it's an absolutely mammoth space and the shell of the building still survives today. Um, I visited on a tour for open house weekend, um, uh, which if, if anyone's not familiar is a kind of weekend in September where there are um, buildings not usually open to the public are are open for free so it's a kind of tour guide Christmas it's yes. great um, <laughs> favorite weekend of the year and um, so it was great to see inside inside the space there but it's just been you know it is one of these abandoned buildings that has been seemingly left to rot but not for much longer Mm. It, it's always fascinating especially the ones that just that like everyone just left one day and didn't come back yeah well it's interesting I mean this uh, Millennium Mills in particular as well because this was actually rebuilt um following one of the worst uh disasters um in um during well during the second world war but not actually a result of bombing it was the Silvertown explosion of 1917 a ammunitions um, and a factory that was involved in making TNT um, exploded and you know the blast radius could be heard for uh, as far as like the Sussex coast it was absolutely massive because this was a storeroom you know for TNT if you're going to pick up something to explode you absolutely don't don't want it to be that um, so this was re this building that you see today was rebuilt following following that explosion. Gosh, wow! When you when uh, when you mentioned explosion, I thought you were going to say because it's a flour mill, and obviously that they're, they're, they 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 that was one of the dangers of, of flour mill uh, flour mills, wasn't it? it? Was explosions? But so they were obviously being very careful, and then oh my goodness. Yeah, so I mean, it was very close by. I don't know the exact location, although there is a memorial to it today. And it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been because it happened in the evening where there were less people working in the factory, but there was still um, over about 70 deaths, possibly more. So Gosh. it was a pretty traumatic event in the, in the history of that area of East London. Wow, wow. Okay, so I've, I've picked out some of my favourite places. 
I'm keen to know, do you have a favourite place from the book? I think um, I, I was sort of toying with this because I think it's probably one of the most famous kind of abandoned places. But I think you have to mention kind of Abbey Mills pumping station because it's just so... It's kind of the beacon of abandoned London places, even though it's actually still in use today um, as part of Thames Water. So I've got I've got the picture here. If, you, if I can yeah. show you, um, so as you can hopefully see, it's an absolutely incredible building, and it's known as the Cathedral to Sewage. <laughs> so it is a sewage pumping station. Um, and I just think it's a fantastic example of how the Victorians in the 19th century, you know, they were so in awe of engineering and of, of new scientific discoveries. And in order to give it the prestige, they didn't kind of shy away from the, the, the kind of nasty elements of it and the functionality. They kind of almost glorified in it, hence all of this beautiful decoration. Um, and yeah, it's just so striking. It's another building that you can quite easily see today if you're walking along a public uh, pathway called the Greenway in Stratford in East London. Wonderful. I, one thing about the Victorians as well. I mean, they they really from the outside you can you, it, from the outside you think it was a public library or museum, but That's even inside they don't stop when they go inside as well. They they carry on. Um, and yeah, there's so many details. It's absolutely exquisite. Really yeah. Well, it, um, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say it's it's very hard to to visit um, Abbey Mills today. They do occasionally run open days, but the the good thing about that is that. London actually has another of these fantastic places, Cross Ness, which is another sewage pumping station, and that has more regular open days. And again, it's absolutely spectacular, the ironwork, the details. You feel like you're in a church, and then you, in the distance, you can see like these huge levers. I'll show you this one. This one's definitely fine, because this is one of my photos. So this <laughs> is fine. So this is inside Cross Ness. Um, sewage pumping station um, and again this is more readily available to visit so there's a few places in the book where they're quite easily accessible which is nice for, for anyone reading. It is it's funny that uh, you know would anyone actually think about visiting a sewage pumping station <laughs> unless it was suggested. Um, <laughs> I, I mean in a previous life I actually um, worked for a water company on the sewage side so I'm very familiar with sewage pumping stations and I can tell you any that are built now are absolutely nowhere near they just they're not engine they're not beautiful in any way shape or form they are very very <laughs> functional so thank goodness for the Victorians to be honest that we have these sorts of buildings because otherwise I don't think we'd have anything quite so pretty um but it's it's I mean the book is fabulous it's an absolutely it's a wonderful collection and record of abandoned London. I think it's a great resource for anyone who is interested in London. Um, not just for, well, I think from any genre, whether you're interested in architecture or social history or the evolution of how places are used and how, you know, human behavior affects the, the spaces. Um, it's really, I, I, I love it. I'm so, so glad that I've got one of the first copies. <laughs> yes, everyone, I did. Um, so uh, before uh, we go, where can people find you, your blog, about your tours? And of course, where can they get the book? Yeah, so my um, my blog is called lookup.london, so all the information is on there because I run walking tours across the capital as well. Um, best place is probably Instagram. Instagram, follow on look underscore up London and the book itself which has been I know very annoyingly out of stock is coming back in stock next week I am told and it's available um, from foils and Amazon and uh, um, Waterstones and also um, available internationally as well so um, yeah if you search for abandoned London the publishers are amber and they have a drop down mem uh, menu with all different kinds of options. It, it, it really is good. I really like it. It's nice and in hardback, so it's going to survive as well. So thank you so much for that, Katie. And I'm hoping to come down to London to see you at some point, which would be um, which would be lovely and um, and pick your brains because uh, 
I just love your uh, your Instagram. It's brilliant. There's so many things that people walk past and you're there saying, did you know this? I think there's some railings somewhere. That's one of the first videos I saw of yours, railings that were stretchers in the war. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's that's really got, what got me obsessed with London's history. It's, uh, it's those details that are hiding in plain sight that you could walk past every day and then it's only when someone points it out or you notice that plaque or that architectural detail. So often in London, it's above your eye line, which is why I called the blog Look Up London. Um, and yeah, and then and then you realise that it's just never ending. <laughs> the research and the possibilities of different places you can discover just are endless. Brilliant. It's excellent. Well, thank you so much for today. And uh, maybe you'll come back and chat to me another time as well uh, about some more bits about London. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me.